afternoon. Welcome to the Pacific Region Forum on Business and Management and Communication. I'm Rosalie Tung, Professor of International Business and Associate Director of the David Lamb Center for International Communication. Our speaker today is Professor Ng. Professor Ng received his PhD from the University of Hawaii and is an Associate Professor and Associate Head of the History Department and Religious Studies Program at Pennsylvania State University. He also chairs the East Asian Studies Committee at Pennsylvania State University. He sits on the Board of Directors of the Society for the Study of Chinese Religions, serves as an Associate Editor of the Journal of Chinese Philosophy, and chairs the University Seminar on New Confucian Studies at Columbia University. The title of Professor Ng's talk today is Rethinking Confucianism, Asian Values, and the Global Ethics of Human Rights and Responsibilities. Professor Ng's presentation will be Followed by a Q&A period. Without further ado, I'll throw the podium to Professor Ray. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tong, and um, also thank you, Professor Jane Walls, for inviting me. So coming here in some ways is um, homecoming. I mean, I don't live here. I've never lived here, but my family does. So in some ways, this is uh, this is also my home. Uh, of course, it's always lovely to visit this resort area here in British Columbia. Um, Although it's kind of cold, I just came in from New York, and it's what's happening, it's <laughs> colder than New York. You know, um, what I want to do today is to think with you, really, about the contemporary relevance and resonance of the Confucian tradition. Now, as you know, since the early 20th century, Confucianism has been much aligned, ridiculed, actually, by the Chinese themselves. Why? Well, because Confucianism was supposed to be the major cultural factor explaining the economic, material, technological backwardness of China. Now, but in the beginning years of the 20th century, we have come to a very interesting pass, actually. The mainland Chinese leaders themselves, no less, are increasingly asking us to look at Confucianism, to look at the Chinese past. And indeed, if you look at the Chinese past, you cannot not look at the Confucian past. Uh, one might even say that the Confucian tradition is to East Asia what Christianity is to Western Europe, to America. And indeed, Confucianism is very much part of the cultural heritage of East Asia. So when you look at the past, you have no choice but to look at uh, Confucianism very, very carefully. Now, when we rethink and revisit Confucianism today, we cannot actually look at it from a narrow provincial viewpoint, and that is, we simply cannot look at Confucianism solely as a Chinese cultural product. Why? Because we live in a global world. So, if we truly want to establish the contemporary resonance or relevance of Confucianism, we really have to look at it in global terms. That's exactly what I'm trying to do today. What I'm trying to do today is to look at Confucianism as a possible global ethic. So, in what way can it meaningfully contribute to making a better world? Not just a better Chinese world, but a Chinese world. Right? Now, before we talk about the contemporary roles of Confucianism, let's say a few things about Confucianism it itself. So, in other words, what are we rethinking about? What are we revisiting? In short, what is Confucianism? Now, Confucianism is both a political ideology, it is also a social ethic. According to this political ideology, according to this social ethic, the so-called five relationships essentially establish the major parameters, parameters of social actions. So, of course, the five relationships are namely those between uh, ruler and minister, father and son, husband and wife, the relationships amongst friends and the relationship between brothers, 
the five relationships. Right? Now, according to this particular worldview, the state really is the family writ large. So the political virtue of loyalty to the emperor, loyalty to the state, finds its counterpart in the social familial virtue of xiao, filiality or filial piety. So the idea is that every individual in one way or another plays a certain role in this web of relationships, the five relationships. Right? So, when you keep talking about five relationships, you, you seem to be talking about hierarchy, you seem to be talking about collectivities. But if you look at Confucianism as a philosophy, you'll find that actually the individual is the centerpiece of this interrelated, this correlative uh, web of relationships. So the idea is that the individual really is the point of departure. The individual actually is the foundation of all moral, ethical pondering or moral, ethical thinking, really. Because the five relationships essentially represent the multifarious social roles that individuals play. So as an individual who is endowed with a goodness, we will play our natural roles in society. Yeah? And in fact, every individual is supposed to cultivate his or her fundamental virtue, the virtue of, you look at this um, outline, the virtue of Ren. Ren. So the idea is that Ren is within us. It is up to us to realize it in the process of fulfilling our roles in the five relationships. Now what is Ren? Ren generally is, is translated as uh, compassion, benevolence, but it's more than that actually. Ren actually is that which is human. So in other words, by saying that I am virtuous by virtue of having Ren, I am human. You know, I have a human heart. I've developed my human faculty. You know, that, that's why it is fundamental, it's foundational in the sense that Ren is that which is humane. Now concretely, what does it mean when you say that what is humane or human? Well, that is, you, you fundamentally have this ability of empathizing with others' misery. You empathize with others. To put it another way, it is the inability to bear the sufferings of others. But you still say, well, it's, it's kind of abstract. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to uh, fulfill really this, this innate goodness. Well, it is not abstract. If you think about the fact that socially and institutionally, the virtue of Ren is supposed to be expressed through this complex of rituals or rites governed by a sentence of decorum, and that is the notion of Li. Li. Again, it's very difficult to translate it. Literally, Li means uh, rites or ritual ceremonies, uh, but uh, it is more than that, essentially it refers to the normative tradition of the Chinese community. Yeah. It is by abiding by Li, by performing Li, that you concretely express your virtue of being human. So the idea is that, you know, to be virtuous is something that is fundamentally, inexorably social, you might say. Okay. So in short, the individual really stands at the center of this dynamic, creative world of interrelations, of correlations. Yeah. In fact, moral self-cultivation yields not only individual excellence. Rather, moral self-cultivation does more than cultivating an individual. Supposedly, your moral excellence will extend to your family, the ordering of the family will mean also ordering of the state and eventually you have the transformation of the world. So you might say that the individual actually stands at the center of a series of concentric circles. You know, there are overlapping layers of social roles. So the individual actually 
plays a very important part in this um, Confucian universe. Now, I would further argue that this particular universe is enlivened very much by a religious sensibility. So in other words, Confucianism actually is a kind of worldview with a clear sense of transcendence. Now, when we talk about religion, essentially we're talking about this notion of transcendence, right? For instance, you know, right, if you identify with God, you enter the kingdom of God, you actually have transcended, you've gone beyond, you've risen above this humdrum and dang human world to be one with this greater force, be it God, be it uh, Nirvana in Buddhist terms, or Moksha in Hindu terms. Now, in the case of Confucianism, what is this notion of transcendence? This notion of transcendence is the realization of one's goodness, that is, the realization of one's ren, so that one becomes at one with heaven. So Confucianism actually is also a religio-philosophical worldview which presumes the possibility of this sort of religious transcendence. Now, what do I say so much about this? I want to say so much about this because as opposed to the common view of Confucianism as predisposed to emphasizing collectivity, in fact, Confucianism emphasizes very much the role of individuality, the role of the individual. In fact, the individual is so important, so powerful, as it were, that it's, it, it is like heaven. So the notion of Tian Ren He Yi, the oneness of uh, heaven and humanity, really, is uh, a summation, is an encapsulation of the Confucian notion of religiosity, one with heaven. And um, when you're talking about transcendence, you're not really talking about stepping outside of the human world, into the kingdom of God, and this is in the uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, rather you're, you're talking about self-realization. The realization of your ren through the and in the process, you become one with uh, heaven. So sometimes this notion of ultimate reality is also known as the Tao, the way. Sometimes it's also known as um, principle. You know, this uh, overarching, this uh, ordering uh, principle of um, uh, workings of cosmos and humanity. Now, so, so far, I've given you a very brief, but I think a fairly uh, authentic, if you will, representation of what uh, Confucianism actually is. Now, let us pause a little while here and think about it comparatively. Now, if you bear in mind the Western notion of individuality, you can readily discern a difference between the Confucian notion of the self and the modern Western notion of the self. The Confucian notion of the self is very much based on the notion that one is born into obligations. One is born into this web of relationships that we call the five relationships. Right? Whereas in the modern West, I'll, I'll go back to this, um, I'll elaborate on this later. I'm just going to want to give you a preview here. Whereas in the modern West, individuality essentially is defined by one's radical liberty and freedom. So in other words, in the modern West, you have this notion that one is always blessed and endowed with unalienable rights. Okay? So the Confucian model is an individual being born into a web of relationship and a core of obligations. Whereas the modern Western individuality is premised on the notion that one is radically free, uh, protected by rights, endowed with rights. Now, moreover, in philosophical, anthropological, uh, anthropological terms, you also see a certain difference between the Confucian self and the modern Western self, and that is the former. The Confucian self essentially presumes, as I just mentioned, a certain harmony between humanity and nature. Ten ren he, you know, heaven and humanity are ultimately one. So the idea is that humanity exists in harmony, in conjunction 
with nature. Now, whereas the modern Western notion of the self is a self endowed with rationality, tremendous power to reason, and by virtue of our reason, and the Cartesian project, Descartes, right? I think, therefore I am. So the very rationality that I have entitles me to actually ultimately harness the resources of nature, not only that, but to subject it to control. See? So by virtue of my rationality, I analyze nature as an object. So there is also a clear distinction between um, humanity and nature. Now, so what I want to do today is to talk about how the kind of Confucianism that I just described may contribute to a global social ethic. Now, but before I do that, I think it's helpful to talk about the various roles that Confucianism has been playing in the uh, contemporary world. In other words, um, you know, when you're talking about Confucianism in the last, let's say, 30 years, what has it been doing for the world, actually? If you look at this outline, well, Confucianism has always been with us. It's always in the universities, in the states, in this country. Uh, and that is, it has always been, it still is, an important object of academic studies. You know? So in other words, um, it has been treated, still is treated, as an antiquarian subject of academic interest. Now, but mind you, this sort of pursuit is not entirely irrelevant because Confucianism, as I just pointed out, is part of the East Asian cultural heritage. To study it is to actually preserve a certain collective cultural memory. Without it, we suffer from collective amnesia. I mean, of course, that's something to be avoided. But the problem is that we simply view or treat Confucianism as an academic subject. We risk it as it were, museumization. So just like a piece of cultural artifact ensconced, placed in a museum, is to be aesthetically appreciated. It's fit for pedantic uh, cogitation. It's fit for, um, even worse, nostalgic brooding of this sort of that. But you know, what does it got to do with uh, our actual world, right? So I want to I wanna tra transcend that. I want to go beyond that. Nonetheless, that's one of the roles played by Confucianism. Now, beginning in the, uh, well, probably early 80s, uh, in various fields of studies, <clears throat> Confucianism increasingly has been treated as a kind of cultural engine for economic growth. You know, the argument is that, thanks to the Confucian value system, which still persists, the East Asian countries, Japan first, followed by Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, all those little, little dragons, little tigers, you know, were able to embark on tremendous economic growth. Now, why is that? That is so because Confucianism is part of the cultural heritage. So, according to this particular theory, Confucianism. Um, does what the Protestant ethic once did for America, for Western Europe, for those of you who, who uh, study sociologists, uh, sociology, the big name is Max Weber. Max Weber talked about how Western capitalism was very much propelled by the Protestant ethic. So the, anyway, the idea is that both the Calvinist Protestant ethic and Confucianism forge a kind of inner-worldly asceticism. What is this inner-worldly asceticism? This inner-worldly asceticism is a kind of value system that is focused on hard work, frugality, single-minded devotion to success, stress on education, most importantly, the emphasis placed on the collective good the willingness to sacrifice individual benefits for the greater good of the greater community. So indeed, in the um, 1980s, 
you find a lot of publications in China, in this, uh, in the Western world, about actually how Confucianism serves as a cultural engine that propels economic uh, developments forward, right? And the idea is that cultural, moral uh, regeneration in the form of reviving Confucianism explains uh, economic growth. Now, this particular sort of interpretation of theory hinges on a single notion, and that is the notion that Confucianism represents a sort of unique Asian value system. And indeed, in the 1980s, beginning with people like uh, Li Kuan Yu of Singapore, there is the idea that we are unique. We are different from the West. And Confucianism is a kind of quintessential, if you like, aggregate of Asian values. It is a perfect encapsulation of what it is to be Asian. You know? So there were in the contemporary world in Asia, unfortunately, Confucianism has also fallen victim to political and ideological manipulation. So many Asian leaders and their supporters essentially argue that, look, we are different from the West. We dare do things differently. So in the process, essentially, they have forged a kind of what I call post-colonial discourse. So, you know, we were actually subjugated. We were semi-colonies, if not actual colonies, but now we have our independence. We are reviving, actually, our cultural heritage. You know, in a post-colonial world, we must nurture and revive our uh, traditions. Now, of course, in very many ways, this sort of theory was propounded for the purpose of preserving highly despotic rule. The idea is that we are different so that we don't have to subscribe to Western-style notion of political liberties. We don't have to subscribe to a Western notion of uh, civil freedoms and that sort of thing. Okay? So the idea is that uh, globalization, in some ways, has fostered a great deal of inequalities that Asia can escape from if we can actually remain true to ourselves, you know? And of course, according to these leaders like uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, globalization is simply a code word for Americanization, you know? It is a code word for imposition of Western practices and Western values, okay? So the idea is that, look, we are much more interested in preserving the notion of collectivities. We are interested in preserving the notion of self-sacrifice. We are interested in mitigating personal liberties for the purpose, actually, of creating a stronger state, that sort of thing, right? So as Li Guan Yu pointed out, the Asians have, I quote, little doubt that a society with communitarian values where the interests of society take precedence over that of the individual suits them better than the individualism of America. And you see the key word is the individualism of America. <laughs> you know, we don't want that. You know, globalization, you know, Eurocentric notion of growth tends to foster this sort of atomistic, individualistic approach to life, which is not good for us. We don't want that, you know. Now, China, really, since the early 1980s, has been actively promoting the study of Confucianism. Yeah? And uh, the studies in Confucianism have become actually quite, quite popular. Uh, in the 80s alone, for instance, over a thousand articles were published on uh, Confucianism. And um, in 1984, a Confucian foundation was established on the occasion of the 2,500th 
35th birthday of Confucius. So actually thousands of, uh, 3,000 actually selected um, Chinese and foreign guests presided over the ceremonies held in the birthplace of uh, Confucius in Shandong in Chufu, right? The temple ground actually was filled with uh, common folk joined to the occasion. The uh, statue of uh, Confucius destroyed during the Cultural Revolution actually was restored. That sort of thing. Okay? In 1990, actually, a commemorative stamp was issued to honor uh, Confucius. So, in other words, Confucianism, Confucius, once reviled, now is actually uh, dear year. If you say, you know, the French hero. It is required by, by culture, it is required by customs, you know. It is a good thing to have Confucianism, right? So a friend of mine actually very years ago when he came back to 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 um to uh, uh, he came back from uh, Beijing he told me hey, I ate at the Kong Jia Dian, right? You know, Confucius shop and said, so you know, being cheeky, he asked the owner, hey, how come you know you you you're honoring uh, Confucius and, and the owners reply and say, why not the best? You see? So in other words, uh, Confucianism is the best thing on earth now, you know, something we have to value. Okay? Now, of course, as you know, China's effort to do that in some ways is simply to uh, try to fill a kind of ideological, spiritual vacuum created by the demise of communism. Because China is still supposedly a Marxist country, but I mean, you all know that it's very capitalistic. And there is really no viable ideology of such, in some ways, actually, uh, Confucianism serves as a perfect ideology, perfect, actually, kind of state philosophy, since, as far as the Chinese leaders were concerned, it celebrates, you know, common good, it celebrates hard work, devotion to the greater common good, and that sort of thing, all right? Now, the advantage of playing the uh, Confucian card, as it were, is that uh, it also appeals to the nationalistic sensibilities of Chinese all over the world. You may be from mainland China, you may be from Taiwan, you may be from Vancouver, Canada, you may be from uh, Hong Kong, you know, any ever great overseas uh, Chinese community can identify with Confucianism. Many of us may not know what it exactly is, but in some ways, you know, we consider ourselves actually uh, inheritors of a certain uh, core value system, um, we call it infusion, okay? So, therefore, in very many ways, China has been promoting Confucianism really as part and parcel of a process of ideological, political manipulation. Now, these contemporary roles of Confucianism described just now all leaves something to be desired. So what I want to explore with you today is to figure out how Confucianism truly, meaningfully, can serve as a kind of spiritual, ethical force that would contribute to the making of a better world. By better world, I mean a more caring world, a more humane world, and finally, a more just world. Now, in 1993, the Parliament of World's Religions met in Chicago, celebrating their 100th year anniversary. So you have representatives from different religious traditions, Buddhism, Jainism even, uh, Confucianism, Christianity, of course, Islam, and all these religious leaders, they gathered in 1993 in Chicago. And one of the major statements that they made was a declaration toward a global ethic. A declaration toward a global ethic. The Dalai Lama was there. The Dalai Lama had actually contributed to this uh, declaration. Now, the idea is that it's high time we developed a global ethical system that could be shared by all peoples and cultures regardless of your religious orientation and affiliation, we all should be able to subscribe to a certain global notion of that which is ethical. Now, when you're talking about global ethic, you cannot not talk about human rights. And indeed, what featured prominently in this declaration of a social ethic, a global social ethic, is human rights. Human rights. 
So it seems to me that in today's world, mm -hmm. human rights discourses have functioned as a kind of common ground. Human rights actually seem to have functioned as a kind of criterion of intelligibility, and that is to say, everyone has some notion as to what human rights is all about, right? So in other words, when you're talking about uh, uh, social ethic, you, you cannot not talk about human dignity, human worth, and ultimately, what should be done to truly protect individuals? How do you find ways to enable, actually, individual flourishing? So therefore, I propose that in today's world, if you want to revisit, if you want to rethink Confucianism in global terms, you really have no choice but to think about it in terms of the current discourses on human rights. So essentially, that's my focus when I actually look at uh, the, the contemporary uh, resonance of uh, Confucianism. All right? Now, before I talk about how Confucianism actually can serve as a kind of global ethic that features a certain strong conception of human rights. But let's talk about the notion of human rights in Western terms. Because really, the notion of human rights grew out of post-enlightenment Western Europe. You know, essentially, it is a 17th century, 18th century Western European phenomenon. Okay. Now, the English word right, as you can see, the blood line actually is derived from the Latin word rectus. Rectus literally means straight in a physical sense. But in time, this notion of right develops from that which is straight to that which is a right. Okay? So in other words, first it denotes a sense of physical straightness. In time, it becomes the notion of moral straightness, moral correctness that which is appropriate, okay? Also, the belief that I may do something or I should do something because it is right, this particular notion is developed to a further notion than that is, I should do something or I may do something because I have a right to it, you see? So from the notion of moral right is develop the notion of a right, a sense of entitlement. And that is to say, I possess certain right, right? So when you talk about human rights, you have to talk about the notion of personal possession. You have to talk about the notion of personal entitlement. There is always this subjective notion that something is owed me, you know. By right, I am free. By right, I am owed a justice. You know, so this is one thing we really have to bear in mind when we talk about the modern Western notion of human rights. And that is this notion of subjective personal entitlement. I am a beneficiary of rights. I am endowed with rights. Yeah. Now, of course, I am endowed with rights because I am a totally free individual, something that I alluded to earlier. And in fact, the fundamental premise of human rights is the fact that every free individual is entitled. Every free individual possesses certain rights. And that is really the basis of the Western, modern Western human rights uh, discourse. Now, can we critique it? You say, hey, what's, what's wrong with that? I mean, I, I'm entitled to rights, and it's good and fine. I, I want to have rights. I should possess rights. Now, in theory, this is a very, very good thing. Who can argue against that? Now, the problem is that in practice, in everyday concrete situations, the picture is not necessarily that rosy. Let's talk about the right of free speech. Now, what good is the right to free speech if, to begin with, you are not educated? 
If to begin with, you are unable to articulate what you want to say, what good is the freedom to speak your mind? Who would your audience be? Who would listen to you? Who would place value on what you want to say? So yeah, in theory, yeah, you have the right to speak your mind. But who is going to listen to you? The right to free assembly. <laughs> Wonderful idea. But what if you are too poor to afford transportation? In the States, you know, go to D.C. in March. What if I cannot afford the fare? Or what if I'm too sick because of lack of health care? So I cannot actually travel. So what good is the right to free assembly if I don't really have the wherewithal to realize such rights? Okay? What about the right to property? What good is the right to property if to begin with you don't have any property? There's all empty talk that you can do whatever you want with your uh, possessions. So what I'm saying is this. The modern Western notion of human rights is truly valuable if we can guarantee individuals a certain level of wealth, a certain level of education, a certain level of property, and a certain level of prosperity. Now, let's look at the world today. What is the reality? A recent UN survey shows us that the richest 20% of the world's population consumes actually almost 90% of the world's goods and services. The richest 20% consume essentially 90% of all goods and services, while the poorest 20% consume fewer than 2% of the world's goods and commodities and services. So my point is very simple. It's nice and good to talk about the rich people. You know, when you talk about the greatness of human rights. Yeah, if you have a certain amount of wealth, prosperity, and education, wonderful. <coughs> but what about the poor folk? Those who have no access to goods, no access to education, no access to health care. Now what? What good is the talk of human rights? What good is talking about human rights, spreading human rights in a dirt poor African country, for instance? You know? So my point is this. If we built a society solely or even largely on the view of individuals as autonomous beings, we tend to yield a society that is uncaring. That is at least passive when it comes to promoting the well-being of others. Now why is that? It's very simple psychologically. If everyone is free, one really feels no huge need to see that others' welfare is improved and guaranteed because I mean, everyone is free. You're free to do whatever you want. As a morally free individual, I have no <coughs> inherent responsibility to see that you are well taken care of. You do your own thing. You embark in your process of uh, individual human flourishing. Okay? That's exactly what the world is all about, you know? Maldistribution of resources. And I think, I think it can be really chased back to this notion that everyone is free to pursue wealth. Moreover, this absolute notion of individual freedom, based on the notion of an individual as a free agent, also tends to breed a litigious society. Now, why is that? Because my individual rights must by all means be protected by laws. And if my rights are injured, I will have to resort to laws to avenge such injury. You see? And in fact, this notion of rights is very much based on the notion of law. You know? So through lawsuits, we can avenge injury to our rights. So in other words, if we simply see ourselves as fundamentally autonomous individuals who are beneficiaries, beneficiaries, we tend not to see and understand others as fellow members of a larger human community. 
So in very many ways, actually, I've just described the kind of society we live in. More so in the States than here, I would say. Here, a Canadian society is far better. Now, I mean, remember, right after 9-11, the constant mantra is that, let's forget about personal aggrandizement. Let's forget about, you know, personal pursuit of wealth and well-being. Let us share, <laughs> right? Newspapers, social commentaries, TVs, you know, constant mantra is that let's share, let's more caring. Well, why do people say that? People say that because they acknowledge the fact that, hey, we may enjoy economic material benefit, but ultimately that's not enough. We have not been sharing enough. You see, so there is this always nagging awareness, if you like, simmering below the surface that more should be done. You know? Now, this is precisely where Confucianism, I think, may step in. And they offer a more commodious, a more uh, generous view of what it is to be a human being. What it is to construct a better society. <laughs> So let's look again, once more, at the Confucian notion of the self. Now, essentially, the Confucian self, as I put it here, is fundamentally a fiduciary self. Fiduciary, that which is communal, that which is communitarian. You, you see? So in other words, the Confucian self actually is always answerable to the needs and demands of community and society. Okay. An individual, in the Confucian sense, as I mentioned, is an individual who is born into a web of relationships. So therefore, the notion of a good life is inevitably a social one. A good life is a social life. The goal in life actually is to realize your run through performing leap. So the Confucian self is never a free individual. It is never a, an autonomous individual because there is this abiding realization that one is always a father, one is always a son, one is always a daughter, one is a student, one is a friend, one is a brother, what have you. All those social roles we cannot escape from. So the Confucian sense of the self essentially reminds us that, hey, you are really not free. Inevitably, you play a certain social role, social roles, you know. To the extent that you are always involved socially in this wider web of correlations and interrelationships, you are always responsible for the well-being of others. Moreover, in treating others in accordance with Li, essentially you cultivate a notion of civility. Because Li essentially is right in rituals, ways of doing things, animated, governed by a sense of civility. Right? So in other words, a rights-based society, R-I-T-E-S, based society, is one that asks us to habituate ourselves to performing proper actions. You know, everything that we do must be answerable to needs of society governed by notions and practices of civility. We call it liberty. The Confucian notion of liberty. Now, let's contrast that with the Western notion, the modern Western notion of self. In the West, as I mentioned, the individual is conceived of as a radically untrammeled self. I call it an atomistic self. An atomistic self, really. And this atomistic self, to begin with, is a claimant of rights. What defines me? It, what defines me is the fact that I can claim ownership of rights. So to begin with, what defines your reasonable being? Your reasonable being is that you have the ability to claim rights. So first and foremost, I'm a claimant of rights. 
in a social contract safeguarded by the laws. They say, well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that, actually. Laws are great. I think laws, you know. But on the other hand, a right space society, R-I-G-H-T-S based society, is one that tends to endorse or encourage a kind of minimalist ethic. Minimalist ethic. And that is to say, I can do whatever I want as long as I don't exceed the bounds of laws. In a unethical, but it's legal. You see? So in a rights-based society, you, you tend to generate this sort of uh, uh, psychological view, viewpoint that say, hey, it's okay. I'm not breaking the law. I can do whatever I want. You see? So as the eminent moral philosopher Charles Taylor laments, instead of saying that it is wrong to kill me, we begin to say that I have a right to life. You see? It is wrong to kill me is a moral statement. It's an ethical statement. It is wrong to kill me. This is a moral, ethical, value judgment. But we don't say that, actually. Rather, the emphasis is that I have a right to life. You see? So it's quite different from the Confucian fiduciary self, which is governed by civility, by Li. The Confucian notion of self asks us to see ourselves as co-members of a family, of a group, of a community, of a state, and finally, of the human race. So therefore, I think the Confucian notion of sins is capable of generating a more substantial sense of justice compared with a worldview based on individuals as radically free, autonomous. Uh, individuals. Why? Because this greatest sense of justice is based on the awareness that the meaning of one's life is very much dependent on the well-being of other lives to whom one must relate. We have no choice. We are not free. Now, in so touting the Confucian conception of authentic being, I'm by no means suggesting that in the West uh, there are no caring individuals, which is it's not true. You know, there are many charitable, caring individuals in the modern West. There are indeed philosophies that embrace communitarian virtues. However, I do say that in the modern West or in Western modernity, to the extent that it is governed by the language and logic of rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, norms of moral conduct must play second fiddle to laws. Laws trump essentially moral conduct. You know? Laws guide individuals through the pluralistic conflicting interest in a contractually based society. That's what modern society is all about. What's wrong with that? But there is no denying that in such a society, we tend to, as I said, foster a kind of minimalist ethics. And indeed, if you look at the modern West, there is really no coherent, forceful, political and social theory to nurture and establish a, conce a conception of what we call a fiduciary self. You know, so our economic policies, social policies, actually are essentially based on the notion of a radically free individual. Is it time to conclude? Yes. So let me say a few words about conclusion. I'll cut out some of the details. Uh, it seems to me that in these early days of the 21st century, we've got to realize that in a truly global world, we have to harness the cultural resources offered by other people's cultures. Today, I'm asking you to think about the possibility, the potentialities of embracing at least part of the Confucian worldview in a general global effort, uh, effort to, to create a better world. By that, a more humane world, a more just world. Okay? And I think by looking and by understanding uh, the Confucian 
tradition, we may arrive at certain ways to assuage our discontent with, with Western modernity, you know, really in the post 9 11 world, to the extent that we want to talk about sharing, to the extent that we want to talk about being more charitable. How should we go about doing it? My point is this we must duly appreciate the enormous important function of rights, R I G H T S. Because rights protect individuals against the tyranny of the state, rights based on laws protect individuals against a tyrannical majority. This is very, very important. Laws are very, very important. But at the same time, I think we can improve on this sort of law-based, rights-based society by meaningfully incorporate, integrate certain Confucian emphasis on rights. R-I-T-E-S. By embracing the Confucian notion of rights, R-I-T-E-S, I think we may develop a certain way to achieving human flourishing, human growth as a communal act. Develop the individuals via the building of a greater group. And in fact, a Confucian rights based society asks us to review and reevaluate our current ordering of human priorities. First, should the so called first generation human rights of political and civil liberties always trump the second generation rights of economic subsistence and social? cultural fulfillment. In other words, is it not a government or a commonwealth's foremost responsibility to safeguard the livelihood of the people, to guarantee their access to education so that they are truly able to enjoy human rights? Second, should laws and institutions not be more accommodating of moral and ethical concerns, such as filial obligations to parents and elders. Now, in the States, for instance, there are some surveys that came out, for instance, Asian Americans, 46% of them, according to the survey, play a great role in maintaining the livelihood of the parents, take care of the parents directly, whereas only about 18% of the white population, actually. Yeah. Now, that being the case, should not the government promote tax breaks for parental care. Only tax break for children, that's not good enough. You see? Third, is it not valid to assert the value of communal good at the expense of mitigating sometimes individual rights so as to consolidate ties to greater collectivities such as families and the state? Fourth, should we not pay heed the Confucian vision of oneness of nature and humanity and derive from it certain congenial means of developing ecological perspectives that will better our protection of the environment and the planet Earth, really. Of course, environments and planet Earth fall under what is known as the third generation human rights. And that is, you know, it is the right on the part of the environments to, 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 to prosper. It is, it should be protected by right. Okay. So to ask these questions actually is to hint at the Confucian claim that if there are universal rights, there must also be universal responsibilities. If there are universal rights, there must be universal responsibilities. In other words, we must not only always think in terms of what is due us, but rather we must also think about what we should give. Now to truly conclude, I will end with some words by a 17th century actually Western uh, philosopher, poet, John Donne. I want to hammer out a particular point. I want to hammer home this point that despite 
the different Confucian and Western conceptions of humanity, there are always common universal human insights. In other words, intercultural communications are readily fulfillable. John Donne said, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, any man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, do not send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Every individual's death diminishes me. So essentially, what is this? This is really the Confucian notion of Ren, the inability to bear the suffering of, the, of others, the ability to empathize with others' misery. So I think in the post-9-11 world, it does no harm to give some thought to this Confucian notion of the self animated by the notion of performing rights, animated by the notion of a basic fundamental humanity, which is not simply a Chinese humanity, but also a Western humanity. I thank you very much. Questions, comments, responses? Uh... I'll start. Uh, supposing I were to take the stance of a proud and patriotic North American, mm -hmm. I can do this because everybody knows I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if I wanted to play the devil, that suppose I said, um, aren't individual rights here in, let's say, Anglo North American societies mitigated by, and aren't individual responsibilities acknowledged and encouraged by? The taxation system, which finances public health systems and social welfare systems and to certain extent education systems, which are all for the greater good. Suppose I asked you that. How you no, no, that? actually, it is a fundamental fact of life. In fact, uh, you're absolutely correct. The more progressive the taxation system, the more you get closer to the Confucian uh, notion of rent. Now, I no human community can survive without a certain communitarian notion. Taxation actually is a reflection of that. You know, but I do say that we pay taxes with a huge rush. In other words, you know, it's a minimal eth ethics at the work. Every time you pay tax, you grow. No, why? Why? Because, you know, hey, I'm not morally obligated to pay more taxes than I should be. Because every time you pay taxes, I'm paying more than my fair share. You see, that's a problem because that is the lack of a certain fiduciary commitment to a larger community, right? So, yeah, uh, indeed, toward the end of my lecture, I, I claim that model is there, in fact, let's not talk about taxation. There are lots of charitable organizations, there are all sorts of communities which are devoted actually to realizing our fundamental hu humanity, you know? Uh, but my point is that there is really no true political social philosophy that underwrites, that underpins the kind of philosophy that we see in Confucianism. Now, you bring up actually a very good point, and that is, you know, my celebration of Confucian virtues, in some ways, you know, sound rather far fetched. You know, look at long span of Chinese history. What is Chinese history like? Confucianism is a dominant state philosophy, it has actually produced a rather oppressive society. Now, there are problems in there. So, in other words, if you simply talk about it, Right space society, our ITES society, without due regard to laws. In fact, in my conclusion, I make a point to say that we must give due appreciation to the role of laws. This is very important because I think we have to protect individuals against the uh, caprice and fickleness of a tyrannical state or a tyrannical majority. So it's very important to have laws. But the problem is that, as I said, a law-based law society distinctly is lacking in that sort of more comprehensive ethics that enables us actually to fully develop our human. I mean, as I said, if we are by and large content with things as they are, after 9-11, you don't have, you would not have that sort of mantra about how we should change our ways of doing things. 
So despite our grudge <laughs> against paying taxes, you know, that sort of thing, I'm the lying, our, our very being of this notion that I, I, sh I should do more to other people. But you're, you're basically have a social system here, <clears throat> underpinned by the post-enlightenment notion of self, which essentially encourages um, self-centeredness, if not selfishness. You know. So I'm, I'm not naive as to think that, look, let's be all good Confucians, it's impossible. But at the same time, I think it will do a lot of good if we can actually look at the Confucian tradition, look at the Buddhist tradition. And I think I think I think goal here is, is to mold, is to develop a, a more complete personality in some ways. You know, next door they're talking about you know human well-being and happiness, that sort of thing. I don't know what they're talking about. But it seems to me that they don't make some reference to the Buddhist notion of compassion, the Confucian notion of humanity. I, I think you know it means something to be desired. Yeah. I think you described. I think you described the problem between the you know, the East and the West. And so uh, I guess the challenge now is to try to uh, discover or come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that we're probably in the West way more pluralistic than it is in the East. And so within this pluralism in the East, in the West, mm -hmm. uh, we do have mm -hmm. a fair amount of what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so. Um, my question is, uh, how do you actually develop this ethic? What are some of the suggestions for developing an ethic of sharing and caring? Very simple. I'll give you a very cliché answer through education. I think the problem is that moral education has gone into decline. And by moral education, I'm talking about a sort of prudish education about you know, uh, 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 behavior in accordance with the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about essentially be truly cosmopolitan about uh, about education. So, in other words, you, you, as, as you mentioned, we already have a good deal of the good stuff within our society. Now, how do we tap into that? We tap into that actually through the rediscovery of a humanistic human, humanistic uh, tradition. That's religion. Not necessarily, but humanistic religion first. Religious. Uh, I, 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 I don't. Uh, I don't want to abandon religious tradition if that's what you want. It could be part of the deal, but to the extent, let's say, I'm not really talking about state education first and foremost. I'm not talking about parochial education. If you're talking about state education, which is the most effective way of spreading a kind of literacy, a kind of uh, education, then I think the uh, nurturing, the revival of humanistic study, I think it's an important part of it. And working within the mix too, like, you know, imagine it with, because it's pluralistic, Oh yes, of course, of course. So, so the second part is the cosmopolitan part. The cosmopolitanism pertains to diversity within a particular country. Intra-diversity, as opposed to inter-diversity, both are important. You know. So really, the answer actually is very simple. Yeah. You know, there was somebody on um, Tapestry, which is a CBC radio program, um, aired at uh, 3 p.m. Um, usually on a Sunday. Um, I think he was from India, I don't recall his name. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he actually opposed the Cartesian dual, uh, dialectic. Um, and he says um, he was hinting at a sort of a mutual aid society uh, when he talked about um, I am because you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, think, I, I think the kind of myth that has been propounded in post uh, post enlightened Europe is, is, is the fact that an individual truly is free. There's no such thing. Right. And then I don't think we're giving due regard and attention to that fundamental fact of being human. Yeah, I want to make a point. <clears throat> you have been using rightly the modern European concept of right. rights, rightly because it is just modern. Yes. And uh, this concept has, been, has arisen out, out of the economic necessities and economic opportunities. <clears throat> you know, they developed this idea when they were able to capture the non-European nations and were able to come to America and suppress the local people and 
uh, overpower them and to uh, establish, establish their own rule. So they emphasize more the concept of rights than responsibilities because it suited them. Yes. That is my idea that uh, this has been all a development because this goes just against the, all the concept of Christianity. Yes. Christ, Christ gave us very, very good ideas of self-sacrifice, of empathy, helping the others. But to the extent that Europeans were able to overpower other weaker nations and people, they gave up Christianity and emphasized more their secular rights and right actually to exploit. Because if, if you are not able to exploit others, there's not much idea in emphasizing over rights. That is my point. Thank oh, yeah, you. you're absolutely right. Uh, I think in some ways, uh, uh, the rise of the Cartesian project, Descartes, coincided actually with the uh, beginning uh, massive phase of European expansion. So there's no question, actually, European expansion in some ways um, uh, reinforced the Cartesian project, which in turn, of course, is based on the notion of a radically free individual. Yes, you're absolutely right. And you're also absolutely right that religion certainly could be a major resource in cultivating a fuller sense of uh, humanity. You know, the same Christian Bible, they interpreted to justify slavery, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's right. I mean, of course, yeah. here we're talking about the vulgarization yes, of certain traditions. Quoting, yeah. They were quoting Bible to yes. justify slavery, only yeah. they were giving yeah. twists. Right. So, the, a man can invent any sort of right. arguments yeah. when it is a question of his right mm -hmm. uh, to exist mm -hmm. at least, or if possible, to exploit others. Right. Well, just because, you know, in Christianity, there are many figures, actually many institutions and movements, which tend to breed oppression does not mean that we have to uh, abandon Christianity. For instance, this would be ridiculous to say that because in Christianity there was the Inquisition, we must abandon Christianity. You know, or for that matter, my point is that hey, because you know, Confucianism in some ways actually endorsed throughout history a certain oppressive system against women, for instance, then we should, you know, abandon Confucianism, right? So, so, so the point is that indeed, uh, I think many uh, traditions, be it uh, religious or uh, philosophical, we can find a, a good deal of resources through which we can actually enhance a, a you know, global notion of what it is to be, to be human. That's essentially my point, you know. So, so you know, the center is devoted essentially to, uh, to harnessing basically resources from different, different, uh, different areas, different uh, traditions, right? So I'm, I'm simply suggesting uh, what Confucianism possibly could do. Uh, if, 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 you know, you're a good Christian, hey, I mean, you know, more, more power to you. I think, you know, to, to, to truly realize the Christian virtues, it's, it's true, actually, in some ways, to, to, uh, to build a vision of humanity that is not as narrow as the one that is fostered by, uh, by laws and rights. But look, even at China, just after the Communist Revolution, mm -hmm. they tried to suppress the idea of religion and Confucianism because it did not uh, cater to what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Now that they are um, well off, they are on their own, they yeah. can hold, so they are, I think, uh, propping up this uh, idea again, revival. Well, thank you, thank you yeah. for your input. I mean, I, uh, you have amplified what I've been trying to say, actually. Thank you. But socialism really isn't inconsistent with Confucianism in the way that you define it. Ah, major difference is that Socialism, I think, presumes, I think, classes. And in fact, uh, I think socialism essentially emphasizes um, economic rights at the expense of uh, political and civil liberties. So actually, they're very good in supporting second generation rights, uh, but with regard, I think, to uh, political social liberties, uh, there are some problems. Moreover, in socialism, I think there is a tendency to celebrate the state as essentially the encapsulation of all communities. Whereas I think in the Confucian conception, there is a much more diverse, a healthy regard for the diversity of communities. But when you look at the characterization of socialism as you've described it, essentially that's how you see socialism is exhibited in countries, but the ideal of socialism really is to promote the community. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in that sense, it's mm -hmm. very, very much in line yeah. with the uh, 
Right, yeah. Uh, I would have to agree with you that uh, socialism in some ways is a very, very noble ideal. But I think the problem is that, uh, and also, when you're talking about socialism, uh, you're talking about so many diverse strands of socialism. Um, if you're talking about Marxist pure socialism. Form. I'm talking about in its pure form, you know. I mean, uh, pure pure according to, to whom? Uh, Charles Proudhon? Saint Simeon? Or, or Marx or Engels? Because they're all quite different, but they, they all you know, fly the banner of socialism. Well, but if, I mean, for instance, if you look at the early days of the Christian church, okay, mm -hmm. I mean, it still espoused socialism yeah. in the sense, you know, that everybody who's capable yeah. you know, should okay. be doing the work, yeah. and it really is political really good. I will not uh, dispute your claim at all. If we're simply talking about socialism as this general sense of sharing in order to contribute to the greater good of a larger society. Yeah, I mean, the, the basic instinct there, I think, is very good. Yes, yes. Uh, now, for instance, you know, uh, I, for instance, I claim that Canadian society is probably healthier than American society, and Can Scandinavian society is probably healthier than American society. Why? Because, you know, I think. As we all know, there is a certain socialize this, socialize that, you know, in many uh, of those societies. So, yeah. So, in some ways, they sort of mitigate the, the more uh, unsavory, aggrandizing aspects of uh, free meaning capitalism. Yeah, I mean, socialism is a, it's a noble ideal. I mean, there's no question about it. But, but I'm not so sure if socialism ascribes as much power as it were to the individual as Confucianism does. For instance, in my, in my description, despite all this talk about the five relationships and uh, greater collectivities, mm -hmm. the individual actually is, is very much the centerpiece. And also there is this notion of uh, a kind of religious transcendence. So in other words, the religiosity may not, may, may not be there in socialism. Of course, I mean, we can, we can make an argument that the socialist ideal is a religious ideal in some ways, yeah. No, 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 no I, I don't dispute with you. I, I think it's just that uh, when we talk about socialism, uh, there, there are so many different brands and strands, and it, it's, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> the religious manifestation suggested just now um, a practice that that would essentially be service, high quality service, wouldn't it be? Uh, harmony, with, you know. Uh, and it, it probably also suggests um, a, 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 a leadership, uh, uh, I mean, the collectivity I think is important. How do you animate the people and essentially maintain this sort of harmonious path, this idea of the manifestation of a sort of a higher level of existence? With which is the sort of transcendence, probably, of, um, of, uh, of, of religious transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, so there has to be some sort of her active involvement of some sort of leadership. Uh, you, yeah, of course. But, but, but as I said, let's start with education. Education would produce the very kind of leaders, it would you know, inject the sort of vision, you know, politics with meaning, however you call it, you know, that sort of thing. Right. But it's just, you know, in the States, of course, you know, I live in a very, you know, despairing society in their ways, you know, so, uh, and, and, and that sort of, you know, residual uh, notion of caring for others actually is dying out very quickly under the Bush administration. Do you think Confucianism actually um, and encourages active participation in terms of the overall uh, process of satisfying the needs of the people and indeed in theory, um, yes. establishing, trying to solidify or strengthen this organizational structure necessary for you know, the, the ideal is there. <laughs> the problem is that throughout Chinese history there was no institution. By that I mean you, you have to create a certain civil space. And there was no civil space in traditional China. I think a problem, I mean something, how much time do we have? Okay, now. Can you talk about this idea of civil space? I think you're getting something really key here. Can you develop that? Yeah, uh, no, what I was going to say is this. When you're, talking, when you're talking about the traditional Chinese political order, what do you see? Essentially, you see two ends of one pole. The pole is the body politic. On top, you have the emperor, the sage kings, in theory. At the bottom, the people. In the middle, there's nothing. In other words, there is no intermediary institution that binds the two, uh, two poles together. So the idea is that the sage king, 
the emperor, was the moral force, the emperor's cultivation of his individuality, of his self in a moral way, will result actually in the emanation of moral forces outward so that those people who come into contact with the emperor will be transformed. And who aided the emperors? Essentially, you have a very small group of scholar officials. The so-called Junzi, these, you know, this, this term, this noble man, you know, this profound person. Those who have access to the Confucian way, those who know the classics, they would actually be the ministers, the officials of the emperor. And they, the sage came together with this very small group of the noble men, as it were, essentially assumed this burden of governance. So in that sense, very elitist. You know, they define what the way is, or they transmit it, what their understanding of the way actually was. So there was no intermediary institution that binds really the ruled subjects with the ruling stratum, the sage king. So early, early on, if you look at the earliest classics, what stood out in political thinking in China was that there was this paradigmatic figure. Yao Shun, you know, the founder of the first dynasty, Xia, you know. Why did he become the founder of a dynasty? Because he totally devoted himself to fighting the problem of flooding. You know, for 13 years, he labored hard, you know. He dug ditches, dug channels, channel flood water out in the sea, so and so, that every time he passed by the house, he heard the cries of the children, he would forget to go in, he would refuse to go in. So, so you have this notion of a totally devoted sagely, moral, ethical figure devoted to the common good, and by virtue of such leadership, we will actually have um, a good society. And in one of the classics, made it very clear. How do you bring about peace in the world, the transformation of the world? You start with the individual. Cultivation of the self. Cultivation of the self actually will lead to order in the family. Order in the family will lead to order in the greater community. Order in the greater community will bring order to the state, and finally, order in the state means peace to the world. Peace all under heaven. You know? So, ultimately, everything boils down to the individual. You know? And in fact, what happened in the in, in imperial China would be that, uh, in fact, many of these scholars themselves were beset with a tremendous sense of predicament. On the one hand, they know what the ideal is. On the other hand, they also know what realities actually are. You know, they were trapped in the middle. They have a major sense of burden, but at the same time, this burden was simply shouldered by a very small group of people. Now, how do you spread the burden? You spread the burden by establishing intermediary institutions. And this is exactly what happened in the 17th century, 18th century in Western Europe, in France, in, uh, in Britain. You have the germination of what is known as the cafe culture, the salon culture. Intellectuals began actually to voice their opinions, and in the process they acquired more and more attention. Now, of course, this particular development was also very much related to the growth of the bourgeois culture. So in other words, economic development, the bourgeoisation, as it were, of Western uh, society, enabled the institutionalization of certain ideational practices. So in other words, they began to find actually social political outlet for their ideas. Now, in traditional China, there was no development of such uh, institution. Now, this is not to say that in accordance with rights, R-I-T-E-S, Li, people uh, did not protest. There was a very healthy tradition of protest. Now, let me give you a concrete example. Taizu, Ming Taizu, the founder of the Ming Dynasty, began in the 14th century. Ming Taizu, of course, had a very notorious reputation in Chinese history, one of the greatest tyrants, if you like, you know, implemented cruel punishments, you know, uh, flogged high ranking officials in the court and that sort of thing. One time, he read the classic Mengzi Mencius. You know. Mencius talked about what? Mencius talked about the fact that, hey, if people's needs happiness and welfare was not guaranteed, was not actually protected by the ruler, then the people actually have a right to overthrow the ruler. He didn't like that. So what did he do? He wanted to ban Mencius as a text in the Imperial Civil Service Examination. He also banned, for instance, 
the provincial uh, local uh, ceremony devoted to the honor of Confucius. So now only the state has the right to do so. Now what happens? Then? Massive, massive protest, despite the fact that the officials who protested knew that this guy was crazy. You know, as I said, you know, he killed many people, he flogged many people. In fact, one official carried a coven into the court and said, it would, I would be happy to die for vengeance. Now, in face of such massive protests, actually, Taizu, the founder of Ming Dynasty, withdrew the prohibition of um, worship, of veneration of Confucius in the localities, in the provinces. He also actually led to a mention state in the imperial uh, um, uh, examination curriculum. Now, but many of them did so at very high cost. Many of them actually lost their lives. Now, if that's your choice, to be a moral being, to truly actually embrace this tradition of protest, and the other choice is, hey, there's always imminent danger of being thrown in the prison, of being your, your head chopped up. Then chances are, say, hey, maybe I should shut my mouth. Now, you see, you shut your mouth because you have no choice. But once you have a development of the intermediary institutions, then it's a different matter. Then the intermediate uh, institutions in the locality became essentially organs, mouthpieces for ideas, and they could not be arbitrarily uh, uh, destroyed and done away with by the state of power. And in, of course, you, you have also the uh, development of a legal tradition. Now, if you look at the Chinese laws, what you find is very, very impressive stipulations of all sorts of rules and regulations and laws. But the problem is that if you look at the, let's say, the Ming Law Code, the Qing Dynasty Law Code, what do you see? You see essentially punitive laws. That's one thing. You also see administrative regulations and statutes. So you don't see the kind of laws that we see today, which is aimed at protecting actually the prerogatives of individuals. As I said, you either see punitive laws or you see administrative reg regulations. And all of them are propounded for the purpose of consolidating imperial rule. So you might say that the major problem is that this tremendous growth of monarchical law and power stunted the growth of intermediary institutions mm -hmm. through which and in, in, in which the kind of protest, the kind of values, the kind of voices that needed to be heard were not heard. You know. So essentially, you're really talking about two, two fundamentally systems. So remember, once again, you know, as the gentleman points out here, we're still talking about uh, the, the modern Western uh, development. Essentially, when you're talking about all these good things, human rights, you know, uh, 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 laws based on advocacy, that sort of thing. They essentially uh, are recent developments. You know, 18th century. You know, whereas before, so let me propel this thesis to you. I would have to say that actually the Chinese model may, may be actually the, uh, the norm rather, the Western model actually might be the aberration. So in the last two centuries that we have a certain value system that came to the fore of humanity, uh, spearheaded by the West, but it's only about two centuries old. Whereas the world before, in the 18th century, by and large, actually got forward much, much more to uh, the Chinese model, the Indian model, Ottoman Turkish model, what have you. The uh, tenet of the tenets of Machiavellian uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in ancient... Oh, Machiavelli, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, you know, as I said, we have to be careful here. I mean, I'm, I'm not naively proposing the revival of uh, Confucian, and I'm saying that, no, let's retain the laws. But at the same time, under the rubric of law, let's inject it more healthy regard for the individual, which is one that is inevitably related to the larger whole. That is not a fundamentally free, radically free individual. Can I uh, suggest, because we're, uh, we're at about 3.30 now, uh, that we sort of bring the formal uh, dialogue forum part to a close? And uh, if uh, anyone has questions or issues that they would like to pursue afterwards. Yeah, I'll linger around here for a few minutes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can lock the doors after those who have to leave. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, uh, for your presentation, which uh, if I 
I'm, I'm really glad you were talking about Confucianism. If you were, you know, if you if you were a televangelist, I'd, I'd be sitting there screaming hallelujah. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> fundamental importance of the in the Confucianist tradition of the individual first uh, working to cultivate uh, him or herself uh, and then putting oneself in order and then extending that order to the family and then extending that order to society and then eventually maybe hopefully to the nation. Um, which I think is really, really interesting in light of the, the historical fact that it wasn't until about 120 years ago uh, that uh, Chinese uh, we had to wrestle with the problem, the Nazi problem of how to translate this inscrutable Occidental concept of individual into Chinese for which there was no word. Uh, and which is not to say that there was no concept of the individual. Obviously there was, and you've given ample, uh, ample evidence of this. It just simply wasn't a word for it. And I think this gives rise to a very interesting, well, it's an interesting validation of the fundamental uh, Buddhist concept, for example, this Kongji uh, Shirsa. Uh, uh, that which is not there uh, may be substantive, mm -hmm. or emptiness is, uh, is substantive. I don't want to get into that, but I, I, I want to uh, give you a small token of uh, uh, our appreciation uh, for your visit and for your talk. And you'll find in here uh, a, um, uh, a, a CD uh, ROM of uh, the Simon Fraser University Pipe and Drum uh, Corps. This is, in fact, the world champion. Actually, uh, one in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Uh, I, I, and if nothing else, this will give you a, this will renew your faith in the Confucian virtue of moderation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the other Simon Fraser University uh, apparel, uh, which I suggest you don't wear here, but wait till you get back to the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. This is great. and whatnot, so uh, <laughs> thank you all of you uh, for coming and uh, thoroughly enjoy my conversation with you and my time here. Thank you very much.